This is my family tree. Not completely comprehensive, but it goes back six generations from me, Hugh McCarran to Michael McCarran to Hugh John McCarran with his wife Margaret. They had 11 kids all together, including my great grandpa. And then you go down to my grandfather and aunts and uncles, my father, and then down to me. But if you move back up the chart to my great grandfather's, who had 11 or 10 siblings, one of them was a Joseph C. McCarran, and his son was Joseph McCarran, born in 1917. And today I am with my cousin twice removed, Joseph McCarran. How you doing, Joseph? Fine. Hi, Hi Joe. Uh, so, yeah, I'm here in St. Louis with my, uh, and I was very happy to meet my uh, long lost uh, cousin twice removed, Joe. Yeah. How, how you doing, Joe? Pretty good. Mm -hmm. And um, now, uh, so you were born in 1917, right? Correct. And you seem to be very much a, the genealogist of the family. <laughs> yeah, I have plenty of time in my hands. <laughs> um, now, let's see, you were born in what, February? Of, February 16th. Of 1917, wow. And um, during that time, you have... Uh, You've had a lot of history. Uh, you went and um, let's see. You're married now, or you, well, well your 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 wife passed right away. Right yeah, but you got married and had five kids. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, now is um. So let's see. So tell me a little bit about your life from the early days. Well, uh, I was born in Florida. And then ended up in a lot of blank spots there because I was young yet, but uh -huh. but moved to Chicago sometime in that period and uh, lived on Hamlin Avenue for before I would, well, I went to school. My first school was out of Hamlin Avenue. I don't know the name of it. It was a public school. And then the next thing I knew, we were in Elmwood Park living, had a store front and living behind it. Father was, had started out as a yellow cab driver. He worked nights. And uh, as an aside, uh, mother used to look for change in his pocket during the day while he was sleeping mm -hmm. to get, you know, some of the money. Because that's what tips were. They, these were depression days and, mm -hmm. and, uh, Tips now we change. laugh at getting t tips <laughs> of change. Yeah, well, that was before the inflation that we have now. <laughs> well, somewhere along the line, and I didn't really catch on to it, but apparently the folks were breaking up. And it was a no-no, of course, for an Irish youth in Chicago at that period of time to have his folks divorced. Yeah. And... Uh, very unusual. And it wasn't wasn't easy. First, there was a split up, and whether that meant they were going to get together again. And father took me out to Aunt Bella's in Maywood, where I stayed and went to school in Maywood. I had gone to school in Elmwood Park, mm -hmm. and went to a lot of schools. Illinois, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Illinois, sure. Where. Close to Chicago. So you moved from Florida to Illinois when you were a boy? Yeah, well, I found out I went to Michigan before that, but huh. yeah, oh, wow. but after, sometime after that, ended up in Chicago, yeah. Okay. And, uh, which I almost lost track here, but the, Sorry. anyways, I was living with Aunt Bella in Maywood with her husband. George Denon. She had two, two, two daughters, uh, Helen and Ruth. Might as well get their names in there. Mm -hmm. she, uh, Aunt Bella was a McCarran. She was uh, a sister of my brother, my father. And one day my mother came to take, uh, take me for a visit 
it never came back, never took me back to Maywood. Hmm. And so I ended up back with her in Elmwood Park, along with my brother who had stayed there. In other words, whatever they decided, she was keeping this younger brother and dad was taking the older one. And then we went for a short time, and the fan hit, you know what, and <laughs> we uh, were in, well actually it was an orphanage put there, I know by the courts, but of course I didn't know it, but, and it was, for some reason I think it was St. Anthony's Orphanage, but it, it was a Catholic orphanage because we went to church every morning and mm -hmm. that sort of thing. Then the divorce must have been settled, and I don't want to know what it was about. Mm -hmm. And we were put in to Saint, I mean Bishop, uh, Bishop Quarter Boarding School, bo bo Bishop Quarter Boarding School for Boys. And this was also in Oak Park, 605 West Lake Street, across the tree, street then what was then the proviso, I mean the Oak Park High School uh, auditorium, it's no, no longer there, neither is the, the school. And I stayed there for five years. At summertime, my brother and I did. And it was run by Dominican nuns, so it was only a boys' school and all nuns. And the priest came in, I guess, every morning. He didn't stay there as far as I could tell. And uh, we had Mass every morning, as you might expect. And mm -hmm. All ate in a communal refectory, just like you would in the Army, sort of thing. And we were controlled by the, the main nun, uh, Sister Bernard. Okay. And she was big enough to handle it, any of the boys. Huh. She had a wooden stick, you know, the kind that you use uh, to work oh. in a pot and stuff, but mm -hmm. sturdy enough. And I never, I guess I was a good boy, <laughs> I never got in trouble because I would, it would, that basically was either talking instead of eating or horsing around or not eating your food. Brother Jim, didn't like spaghetti, and he always got in trouble because he, he just wouldn't eat it. And I, I liked it. I've mm -hmm. always liked spaghetti. <laughs> and so he got, he said whacked a couple of times. I didn't know. We, we probably didn't even sit together. We, you know, he was, he was a lowly first grader. And, oh, that's right. Your brother Jim was a few years younger than you, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. He was 14 months younger, but he was two grades behind. It okay. turned out that way. And in fact, I never went to second grade because I kept going around to schools, first school in Chicago, then a school in Elmwood Park, school in Maywood. And so I was just going from first grade to first grade to first grade. Mm -hmm. And when I went to the boarding school, the nuns figured, well, you should be in third grade for your age. And so I, I went. <laughs> and, Jumped up a grade. And I could always complain, well, I missed out on whatever it was in second grade. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so we, we in retrospect, we, we sort of enjoyed the boarding school. Summertime, so we never got to go to summer camp because mm -hmm. I guess Dad was saving money. Mm -hmm. He was working his way up in the cab company. But he was still, you know, money was a factor. So we'd be shipped to either grandma or sometimes my mother was in town at the Hamlin Avenue address and we'd stay with her and stayed with Aunt Mary another year. Whatever year L. Smith came to town for the, he was running for president. President against Roosevelt, right? Yes, yeah. whatever year that was. I'm sure. And I remember being at Aunt Mary's when the either the Graf Zeppelin or the other one passed over. You know, looked like a mountain up there. <laughs> the Zeppelin, you know, the 
Oh. Yeah. And from there, uh, we went to uh, Berry Avenue, which was a short street down in the city, and at the, the juncture of Halstead and Clark. In Chicago. And Berry Avenue shot off from there. And I did my eighth grade there. And uh, I guess Joey, uh, Jim was sixth grade, whatever. And we enjoyed that because we got to go down. We were close to the Lake Michigan. And in the summer, we were free as a bird and <laughs> go down there. Hmm. And after that, then <laughs> I went to St. Patrick's High School. And Dad worked across the street. He was now a garage manager with a, a fleet of yellow cabs. And uh, I was taken out of there after the first semester. And what happened is he married this Polish uh, woman, a widow. She was a, had a young son and a daughter younger than we were. And we all moved in together out in 5944 Wrightwood Avenue, which was close to Austin Avenue and a little south of Belmont Avenue. And then I went to, after St. Patrick's, I went to Foreman, then Wright Junior, before it was the junior college. But, and then from there I went to St uh, Schur School. And finally my fourth year, I was in the first class at Steinmetz High School. Hmm. Wow. And as soon as I graduated, I wasn't happy there, to tell the truth. Huh. But that's, I don't want to expand on it. Uh, as soon as I graduated, in fact, at the graduation, Uncle Willie, or for some of you, Grandfather William. That was my, gr my great-grandfather. Yeah. Your, which is your Uncle Willie. Yeah. And, uh, That's the only name we ever knew him by. That was him there. He came to my graduation, gave me a pen and pencil set, and a job at his Ford agency. McCarran Ford dealership in Chicago. Right. Damon and Division area. Wow. And that's where your Uncle Willie, which is my great-grandfather, as well as my grandfather, and his younger brother, my grand-uncle Bud. Yeah. Even Uncle Walter worked. So you got a job there right after high school. Yeah. And he gave you that pen set as a present, right? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. And I heard later from Jim that that happened with him, that Uncle Willie came to his graduation, that Dad missed it because he had broken a leg, which I, didn't, I don't know anything about. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because I was gone then. I moved out of the house when I went to work for Uncle Willie. Okay, so you moved out and moved to Chicago, or you're already in Chicago, but you lived... Yeah, uh, I, I moved on to Damon uh, Avenue, close by. I could walk across the street to the... Now, you said the McCarrens were from Northern Ireland, but not Northern Ireland, the British part, but the northern part of Ireland. Yeah, the Irish part. Yeah. Donegal. And Donegal County, so there's... No. Yeah, Donegal County, yeah. And then... And... Uh, that Mina Hall. Clonmany Parish. And there's a town there, Clonmany. Clonmany Parish. And then a place called Altahalla. Altahalla Hill, near Mina Hall, right? Yeah. And that's where a lot of the McCarrens are from. Yeah, they they, they say that uh, that's the central point of them. The... Hmm. Okay, and, and these were some houses that you found. And you think these are very old, ancient yeah, houses. Yeah, and, and the neighbors uh, stipulated which ones were which, and uh, these were all McCarran's. McCarran houses. And you think these houses might be over 100, 150 years old? Oh, yeah. Well, oh. that is interesting. Yeah, look a little run down now, but <laughs> nobody's lived in nobody's them for lived decades. For years, I guess, yeah. Wow. So that's your father, Joseph Sr., and that was during the war, during World War II. So 1944, let's say. And that was him as a boy. Correct. 
And he was uh, he was lived from eighteen ninety five to nineteen seventy. Yeah. Well. So this is around nineteen hundred, but I don't know. Yeah. Well. That was a picture of your brother who fought his way up Italy during during the whole war, pretty much. And he, I always thought, you know, looking at photos, your brother looked a lot like you, you know. <laughs> so, your brother James, who passed away six years ago. Right? Yeah. Okay, yeah, picture of you and your brother around 1940, and you're the one playing the guitar. <laughs> right. Well, that is neat. So you said that was a Rockney, not Rockney Studebaker. Rockney, that he, you know, like Newt Rockney? Yeah. <laughs> Rockney. Rockney Studebaker. He was big then. Hmm. There's one there of him again. That was Joe. And that's his brother, Jim. And you said they look very similar. And your brother, Jim, had the luxury homes. You said you think it was Albuquerque, right? Yeah. Oh. Okay, which one was this one again? Which person was this again? Oh, James Harkin McCarran. James Harkin McCarran. He was an uh, uncle of yours? Right? No, he was uh, a brother of uh, Hugh, McCarran, uh, Hugh McCarran. Oh, it's Hugh's brother. Okay, so we're going up a bit. Okay. And you said he was in the Indian Wars and World War One. Yeah, the yeah. end of the Indian Wars. He was in the same outfit that Custer was. Oh wow! The same, the Seventh Cavalry. So he was Hugh's brother. Okay. Wow. And there was uh, you and you and your brother, James. It was James on the left, right? Yeah, James on the left. And uh, you're on the right. And Joyce, a half sister, is in the middle, right? Yeah. Okay. And that was your mother. Correct. Wow. And there was the other picture of your mother. Uh, before the auto accident, obviously. Yeah. Right. I'm not. I don't know. Or maybe she. Okay. Yeah. This this was in the photos I found at my dad's house from my grandma left behind. This may have been a McCarran truck. You're saying it might have been, but it's stripped down. It's hard to say. You know the chassis yeah. or whatever of a McCarran truck. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Jeez. So that's your uncle George. The one that I had a picture of earlier with the little girl goofballing in a prisoner's uniform. <laughs> That's cute. Now my grandfather, William, which is uh, Joe's cousin. There's a picture of him as a little baby. Looks very similar to me, my sister, a few other McCarrens. Or McCarran relations. My grandma and grandpa on their wedding day. Joe never met my grandmother. He might have met her barely, but he didn't know any of the kids, which one of which was my father. And there was Grandma and Grandpa on the left, and I'm not sure the woman, Uncle Bud on the right, who was Grandpa's brother. And there was Grandpa in, you know, his middle-aged days. And Grandma and Grandpa, kind of as I remember them. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, and then uh, one of the siblings I didn't mark down, one of my aunts and uncles, uh, was Bobby, who died when he was only a few years old, around the early 40s. That was a that was a tragedy. My dad never got over that. There's Joe and his brother Jim when they were kids, probably around 1920 or so. The cute picture. <laughs> Yeah, so the, we're unsure of these photos, but there's a possibility it could be Hugh McCarran, maybe. But it could also be the Walsh side, which married the wife of George McCarran. Yeah. Wow. Interesting. Now, Joe, what's the name of this church in Ireland that you visited? St. Mary's in Clonmany. St. Mary's in Clonmany, and that's where Michael got married, and Hugh was actually born there, or baptized there, baptized there, wow. Well, Joe, it's, I know I, I'll probably kick myself later and say I forgot something, but, uh, but any, uh, final words of wisdom on McCarran family history or life or anything, or? Anything. <laughs> well, I'll say this, that, Michael McCarran came in 
to America with his one first son, the only one born in Ireland, and, and his wife, and they came in through Boston and were there through at least 1865, and they, and they later went to Detroit, Michigan, and, uh, well, the older folks lived there till they died. And uh, some of the McCarran scattered that I've never been able to track down, but I've been able to track down the youngest son and the oldest son, who was you, mm -hmm. and the second son, who, who was a Michael, and he never had children except an adopted child. And uh, one, James Harkin, I thought had never married, but apparently he did marry, but had no children. And he is famous for have killing, for killing a bear in Alaska or the Yukon, I'm not sure exactly which, when he jumped out of a canoe to, to get onto the land and, and, oh. and, and scared up a couple of bears. I don't know who was more afraid, but one came after him and he killed it and it made the news, uh, a sports magazine, and, but I've never known which one. And uh, he was also a musician and he has painted one of the presidents, but I don't know which one. And generally he had an interesting life and he died out west uh, in a, okay. a home. But when he was supposed to be in the home, I found him still prospecting in, in California <laughs> for gold. He was oh, a sure. prospector besides being a in the Seventh Cavalry, oh, uh, and that sort of thing, he, he joined. He went into two wars. The second one, he became an officer, mm -hmm. and he was about age fifty or so. I can't vouch to the exact age, but hmm. which one was this again? You, which McCarran was this? Or? This is James Harkin James McCarran. James Harkin McCarran. Okay, wow. The and one he, that we have a photo of him as an officer. He was Hugh's he brother. Hugh's brother, right? Yeah, he was one okay. of the brothers. Okay. Well, I thank you very much. It's been fascinating uh, to get some McCarran history, and uh, it'll uh, enrich generations. So, thank you. Okay. Thank you, Joe. Well, I know I said we were done, but I had to get this coat of arms real quick. <laughs> the McCarran coat of arms with a camel head on top, and uh, it's gold on top. Two thirds bottom is red. And Joe, you were saying real quick that you believe our family, Michael, came over in 1854 with his baby Hugh, right? Right. Um, because earlier I was telling everybody we came over between 1881 and 1883. I must have misread something because you said that Michael's other son was born in 1854 in Boston. Which meant he had to come over, and since he was born 1853 in Ireland, that means he had to come over in 1854 pretty much. You know, so, or the end of 1853. No, I did hear a story that Hugh came over later with others of the family. Mm -hmm. But it couldn't have been the immediate family because uh, they only had, they were newlyweds. Mm hmm. Okay. So, so their second, third, the children were, first half dozen about were born in Boston, then the rest were born in Detroit, Michigan. Okay. But the first one was born in Ireland in 1853, and the second one in 1854 or five, depending on the, on the, uh, what date you believe. So they had to come about 1854. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Joe. Right. Okay, I'm with cousin twice removed Joe McCarran again. Uh, he's moved since the last time I uh, interviewed him. <laughs> and um, But we're still in the same town, Kirkwood, uh, Missouri, yeah, yeah. which is uh, part of St. Louis pretty much, or, or very close to. Um, 
so anyway, I was going to uh, ask you a few questions maybe that I didn't get to last time. And then it's possible we'll repeat a couple things, but generally speaking, um, I wanted to, after that, get to a couple of the McCarran history items and then also your life since World War II. So first I wanted to, let's see, ask you, uh, okay, a few, just a few questions I wanted to go into. Um, let's see, you were, uh, okay, you talked about your Uncle Willie, my great-grandpa, and you said and this consensus between you and your brother, what he wrote about him was that Uncle Willie was pretty grumpy and grouchy. And <laughs> Now I'm just going to ask this for the heck of it, but was he ever loving or affectionate? Did he ever hug or say I love you or any of that? Or was it always pretty yeah, much... I never saw that. Never? Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> now, uh, let's see, any... Uh, In fact, my father never did that. Yeah, it's some people more than others. I, others I, not I, so much, you know. I don't know whether it was the time when people kind of hid their feelings. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I hear you. Okay. Now, one other thing I wanted to ask you. My grandfather, William McCarran, your cousin, Bill, I know you said that because he was about 10 years older than you, that you were not as close to him. You did not know him real well. I mean, you knew him, but you were not as close as you were to maybe per perhaps say Bud. So what I wanted to ask is, um, do you have any memory specifically, um, hold on one second, uh, okay, any, me any, uh, specific memories about any conversations at all with Cousin Bill, you know, like anything you could drum up, like where you talked about something or, or any, any trivial memories, any little, you know, little things you could point out that you remember at all? Well, like I say, had more input with uh, Bud. Mm -hmm. And even when we were little and used to go to the house, I think he probably was the one up in the, up in the second story, this is Uncle Willie's house, mm -hmm. making off he was Santa Claus or something. <laughs> That sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Because he was more that type. He used to kid me. Bud was. Bud, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So, whether it's just a matter of age difference, but he was a little closer to us. Mm -hmm. uh, because when we were young, he was younger. Probably before he worked. That mm -hmm. sort of thing. And, and uh, the others were always more serious. Okay, so you just don't, but there's no thing that you ever talked to Bill about that you can remember off the top of your head, no. I mean, I know, like, if I talk to somebody in grade school, I can't remember the conversation, but I'm wondering if you remembered anything. Did you ever talk about a sports or about business or about, that, that you remember that sticks out in your mind no. with Bill? No, I don't remember. Okay, so you remember him, even, just not specific. Even my Walter, uh, the Walter had an office, but he was mostly away. Mm -hmm. When he'd come in, he didn't talk to anybody, it seemed, you know, he'd just go in his office and do whatever he do, did in the office. Probably use the phone or something. And, because he was wrapped up, even though he says he's part of the business, he was always wrapped up in the other part, you know, the, the uh, well, somewhere along the line it was politics, but also the trucking business, mm -hmm. starting, he... I think he was editor of the paper or magazine that they put out. It's neither one, it's a different term than that. What would it be called? Sort of a publication publication for the um, motor outfit. Okay. Okay, Joe. Um, so we were talking uh, a minute ago about, uh, I wanted to ask you about any gangster-related stuff in the family. Now, a couple things. One was the 1962 bombing of Walter Jr., which was in the Tribune or some major Chicago newspaper. Um, you thought that that was uh, 
uh, they were aiming for Walter Sr. and maybe got Jr. by accident. It was a union type of thing. Well, a report that I have somewhere was by Walter stating that it was not uh, Walter Jr. Mm -hmm. okay. Stating uh, that it was his father should have been Bob Monroe. <laughs> not should have been. Bob they were aiming for it. They were targeting. They were for. Yeah. Wow. And and you think that was because the they wanted to take was, mm -hmm. Go ahead. was that uh, he was involved with the trucking organization that he was a big part of, mm -hmm. if not the main person. And uh, he, he ran it for quite a while. And I'm sure that the bigger unions, now I'm, we don't want to get mixed up between gangster and unions, mm -hmm. but these, this stretch isn't very big, <laughs> you know what I mean? We know the unions were often controlled by gangsters, at least back a ways. Mm -hmm. And uh, so if I say gangster, I mean the other... A lot of times big, there's tie-ins. The eh? National Union, whatever it was then. Okay. So back then, do you think that the reason they did the bombing, they were aiming for Walter Sr. and they wanted to take over the union? Or was that something... And well, that was the reason they bombed him? They maybe agreed to compromise or become, you know, join up. Okay. Because they were powerful in the Midwest, the Walters Union. I say Walters Union. I'm not uh -huh. indicating it was his, but... Yeah. But he was a power figure in it. Which union was he a power figure in, Walter? Senior? I think it was Midwest. <coughs> Didn't it say something in his bit? Oh, um, yeah, it was, uh, let me see. Okay, I have the obituary of Walter, a brief one. It said he was a Cook County coroner from 1952 to 1960. The first Republican to occupy the office since 1928. He was Oak Park Republican committeeman for 12 years, active for service in the family-owned McCarran Trucking Company, and for 25 years, executive director of the Illinois Motor Truck Operators Association. That's Was that a union? That's it. Okay, and a publisher of the Motorway Transport, a national that's, trucking publication. I have a copy of that somewhere. One of them. So, Not in the house here. So his mobster's probably trying to get him to play ball with him. That's what it was, yeah. Okay. Now, you also mentioned, you know, off camera a minute ago, we were talking about your your father knew something about some... Well, he he was manager in the company at the time that there were union strikes going on. Mm -hmm. And this was apart from the Chicago Yellow Cab and Checker War. That was different. That was... a battle between who was going to be the big company. No, no, you I don't mean to interrupt you, but your father, you said he was he ran a garage before, but what you meant was it was a taxi garage. Yeah. Right? And it was so he your father was a manager of a taxi company. Is that correct? Well they had more than one garage, but uh, Okay. This was the one downtown area. So your father was manager of one of the garages yeah, of a well, taxi company. Later he became above that. Okay. And so what were you saying a minute ago about, anyway? Well, it, it was referring to a time when people were organizing unions and they also were doing it for the cab companies. Mm -hmm. And there was an individual, in, an individual, I can't <laughs> say it talk this morning, who was trying to organize that particular garage. And... The most he ever would admit to was that he got word one day to put that person in the garage uh, cab number so and so to drive it. Okay, and do you know why your father was asked to? Well, he knew what it was for. They were going to beat him up. Oh, jeez. That's what it was for. He never said what happened. I'm assuming he just got beat up. You're talking about a cab driver? He was a cab driver, but he was trying to organize a union in oh. the garage. 
Wow. You got to get that picture. <laughs> yeah. That's the, I got the picture, but uh, from a later date, you don't get it. Wow. So yeah, so so the yeah, so the mobsters did not want them to try to organize a union here. Um, oh no, this wasn't mobsters in that. This, this was, was just the, this was just the cab companies. The cab company themselves were beating them up, or trying to get some. No, they'd have, they'd have uh, people come in, but there wasn't regular gang. The gangsters, per se, were gangsters. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, into liquor, into prostitution, and all that. And then they started getting into, to unions and stuff. Mm -hmm. So I don't think they were that far along on that. I think it was just the company trying to break unions. Okay, so which company did your father work? Was it Yellow or Checker? Yellow. Yellow, okay. Wow. Um, so his bosses were telling him to get the cab driver. That's put him out. Oh, jeez. Yeah, and they have what they call strike breakers. They had a different name for them, but... Uh, uh, Scam. <laughs> uh, they, they'd come with weapons, not guns, but they'd come Bats clubbing or it at, at, say, a rally or something. And it used to be pretty brutal. Jeez. Okay. Um, okay, let's see. Did Uncle Willie get mad at you? when you quit your job there to, to be an elevator operator? Like, was he mad when you quit? Like, that I know of. So, so you just gave him, you just gave him a notice and said, hey, I got another job, and he was okay with it? I guess so. I don't you don't have much memory of quitting specifically, right? Well, I had a better offer, even though it was part-time, it was going to be more money. But, I mean, Willie, Uncle Willie didn't get offended that you're going to know. someone? He probably didn't know it until... <laughs> Maybe someday he say, where's, where's Joe or something. Oh, so you, you talked to a middle manager, not Uncle Willie, about quitting then, right? Probably. I'm sure that's what it was. Okay. And, um, let's see. It's not like nowadays. It was just, you know, it was a cor corporation, but it was a small outfit. Yeah. And, you know, and, and uh, family mostly, and. I don't know, it's just uh, I hear you. not like nowadays where they write something, I'm, I'm quitting. There's none of that, you know. There, there is no, like, I go crazy in some of the stuff I'm doing because it was, people didn't have, you know, social security or, or, or numbers or anything. And they could almost use any name and there was no way of checking, that sort of thing. Oh, I know, but since you were his nephew and he knew you personally, I was wondering if he like he didn't seem offended that you quit for another job or probably something. Not. Okay, and um, he probably made room for me. Yeah, out of high school, just he he came to Joe mentions Jim mentions that. <laughs> <laughs> Your Joe, <laughs> your brother Jim. Jim mentions that. Oh, I got a son, Joe too. Yeah, that's true. Joe. That's true. Yeah. Uh, uh, Jim mentioned him going to the, his graduation. He yeah. Went to my graduation, too. Yeah, you mentioned that he gave you a pen set. Pen and, and pencil set. And offered you a job. And then your brother Jim wrote down that uh, Uncle Willie, my great grandpa, gave uh, him a job, too, when he graduated Steinmetz High School, I believe it was. Um, so, and yeah, that was interesting reading Jim's account. I'd love to talk to him if he were still around, you know? <laughs> yeah, you can see. He stayed with the McCarrens when I left. I left in, well... To become an there. elevator operator. But, you know, by 1937, I was going out, out of Chicago. And he was just starting, probably, to drive for Uncle Willie, mm -hmm. all that sort. Probably for lunch money. <laughs> Maybe not even money, just lunch. Yeah. But, you know, there's interesting things about Uncle Willie. Like I've said, I can remember... He and I, because when he's talking about, in, in we were just talking about uh, him crabbing at the 
people who on strike strikers sort yeah. of thing. Well, we were younger then. I wasn't working yet for them, that mm -hmm. sort of thing. So why we were riding with them, I don't know. Oh, God. <laughs> At one time, when I was working with him, he took me to the courthouse to see a trial. Oh, yeah. And uh, it was a trial, I guess, somewhere out in the suburb, suburb where the uh, poor uh, the poor guy who was you know, uh, bringing up charges against this guy lived out in the suburbs. And the day I was in that the trial with Uncle Willie, what she did warn me about, you know, was this big, huge, I'll say it right out, Italian-looking gangster. Oh, wow. Was on trial for, uh, they'd go around and, you know, collect money from the business. Oh, muscle yeah, man, yeah. Muscle man. And uh, this, you couldn't, you couldn't make it in the movies more obvious. <laughs> and the poor, meek-looking guy somehow or other had guts enough to do it. To testify against yeah. him. And the big bruiser had, that day, had his natives, uh, his neighbors come in and say what a good guy he was. Well, probably he was in the neighborhood. Uh -huh. He was in a nice neighborhood. Yeah. He had to behave. He was somewhere up the line, I guess. It, wa it wasn't the big wheel, but it, it was bigger than him <laughs> as far as the size. And, uh, and I don't know if Uncle Willie went to it every day or not, or whatever happened in the trial, whether the guy who, who won. But you watched part of the trial, right? I watched the one day. Oh, wow, okay. But the day I watched was so, so like the movies where the obvious size difference. Yeah. The meekness. The, it could hardly. It was like some out of a James K. Even though we tried to talk well and all that, it was so obvious he was. <laughs> a big thug, huh? Yeah. But then he brought in these well-to-do neighbors who, well, they knew he's always a good guy, probably afraid to say <laughs> anything yeah. else. Oh, boy. That would have been interesting. I wish it would have... That was an interesting period, really, uh, in Chicago. Uh, yeah, the post Capone era, yeah. Um, it wasn't post... It wasn't... It wasn't post... It was during the Capone era? Oh, yeah, because... Oh, that, I guess that's right, yeah, up to the 40s, so that, the 30, yeah. That would have been, the, yeah. Yeah. That would have been interesting, like a, yeah. some out of a James Cagney movie. <laughs> yeah, we were alive when the Valentine's Day Massacre, we, yeah, we oh. were along in age. Wow. Now, um, let's see, the, uh, what do you know about Uncle, my granduncle, Walter, your cousin, Walter's uh, World War I experience? I I don't think he went overseas, but I can't be sure. Mm -hmm. uh, and he got in the motor pool or sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Just by the name of the thing, you know. Just like Dad, when he went in in 45, he was, he was as a specialist in uh, automotive because he'd been in that business okay. with, with the artillery. So, uh, so probably Walter did not see combat. Not that I know, but he had the equipment because I once saw his uh, World War One hat. Yeah. I didn't see any uniform, but he had kept that. You know, you keep uh -huh. stuff like that. <laughs> Your father was never on World War One, was he? No. Okay. But I saw the the uh, draft information. You know. Okay. All that stuff is in the paper. I, I got it for Walter, too. It's not in there, but I've got it, you know. I've got so much stuff that you haven't seen. <laughs> That's why I ran a couple of copies off of, of, uh, of Murphy there to show you some mm -hmm. of the stuff I picked out of the... For my mom's side, yeah. 
Well, yeah, but, it's, but it just happens to, this is what I used for source. Uh -huh. Going back each census and, and finding a birth date and a wedding date, which I was trying to get, uh -huh. <laughs> death dates, and uh, that's what makes up that. Okay. Um, now, can you tell me real quick about that uh, robbery that happened at the Karen Ford dealership? I guess this is a favorite story. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it's not something I saw, and it happened mm -hmm. sometime after I left, but it was told by Walter Jr. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and they were down below while Walter, while William was... Uh, My great-grandfather, your uncle Willie. <laughs> in the garage area where the workers were. And you said it was similar to the TV show Taxi, where Danny or, DeVito, Louis De Palma, the character yeah, was up was in up that cage. The and you said it would look similar to that, right? Except he used it for sleeping quarters. Sleeping quarters. And to watch the workers. Okay. So... <laughs> And and uh, apparently the robbery was occurring downstairs, in the or the money was anyways, mm -hmm. and he was sleeping upstairs, and they were practically on their knees, praying that he wouldn't wake up because he had a pistol up there <laughs> of some sort and uh, would have come knowing his his attitude and <laughs> that he would have come down gun blazing or, or oh, trying okay. to stop it. And they oh. were afraid because more afraid of him than the robbers. <laughs> Jeez. The robbers apparently were civil, you know, they just weren't there to kill, they were just to rob. Wow. So what happened in the end? Did they rob the place and Uncle Willie never woke up? Yeah, that's right. Uh, <laughs> do, what, do you, did they say anything about what happened when he woke up and found out about the robbery? Or? I can imagine. <laughs> I didn't ask. Uh, did they ever catch the robbers, or do you know? Or? Probably not. Uh, Probably boy. not. <laughs> okay, um, let's see. Part of the expense of doing business. Yeah, boy. I'm sure they didn't have that type of insurance then. <laughs> okay. It's reported to be the Hugh McCarran Number one, Hugh McCarran, number one, dating back to the 1800s. Early 1800s. Early 1800s. This is inside it with uh, myself and two daughters. And, uh, Patty actually, and Debbie? Or is that Debbie Patty and, and Patty, yeah. yeah. And uh, <clears throat> this is some of the natives of the area who we got part of our information from. Okay. And... Uh, this is another McCarran house only. I don't know which one. But uh, he and five of his children <coughs> died and, and are buried right on the plot. Uh, <coughs> uh, I talked too much already. And uh, just buried there and it was during 1845, 1850 during the uh, famines, famine. Well, it may have been disease, but <coughs> I have to get a drink. Okay. And uh, is that that same one again, or uh, the other McCarran place? <coughs> I think this is another one. Okay. Okay. So yeah, that's okay. Cool. Okay, you're saying this house here was where Michael and Hugh, Hugh seen Michael, Hugh, and Ellen. They all lived before they moved to America. <coughs> yeah, it's supposed to be the last house they lived. The last in. one. Well, and what, where's this located in Ireland again? A place called Binion, but of course it's not far from. That. It's near Donegal. Oh, it's in Donegal. It's in Donegal County. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Binion's just a. Remember, they didn't have vehicles to drive around in and all that. They didn't go that far from anywhere. Okay. And just for a quick <coughs> overview sake, here's Ireland in general, and Donegal is here, and where the little dot is, is roughly There's, the area where the McCarrens are all from, around yeah. Altahalla. Altahalla is the... Yeah. 
is the uh, town line, township. Okay. Township. Okay, so here's a picture of your mother, Joe uh, Lillian, but but she was born Julia, yeah. right? Julia. What was the last name? Healy. 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 And uh, she passed away in 1966. Am I correct? Something like that. Yeah. Okay. You're better at it than me. <laughs> well, I do it. So many dates and stuff. Okay. Now you. Let me see this. You were in Dachau. Uh, you were there shortly after the liberation. Do you think you got to Dachau like just what one or two days or a week after the liberation? Oh, yeah. Well, we were attached to the 45th Division, and and they entered into it. I'm not even sure how much fighting there was because the Germans already were starting to, you know, trying to get people out and that sort of thing. Yeah. The live prisoners, and like I didn't know till just recently. The Dachau had three camps, and I think we were at the main camp because Debbie, I had mentioned 45th Division. Uh -huh. She says, well, there's a different division I saw. Well, then I looked up, and there were three different camps <laughs> and three different divisions uh, illiberated. And, so this, this is... Th these well, were not these were not your photographs. They were taken by the no, but, by the company. But, but I have photographs. But you do of, have photographs you took with yeah. your own camera. They're and just I, not I here right now. I have photographs of our, uh, our bulldozers digging trenches. Wow. For the people to just dump the bodies in, and these were the local people that that somebody in power, in American in power, mm -hmm. I don't know who, made them come out. Go through the line. Oh, the uh, locals had to bury them. They yeah, I heard that. Them, yeah. The local Germans, yeah. yeah. Oh, we didn't know about this. Well, yeah, they claim they ignorance. They had to smell it. Yeah, it's like, boy, how could you not know what's yeah. going on, you know? And, okay. uh, you know, when ran across German prisoners, well, Italian, for instance, mm -hmm. <laughs> they are. I, we were their buddies, they thought, mm -hmm. <laughs> but, because never saw an Italian against us, but the Germans, you know, were a little more reserved, but I never felt hate for another soldier, because you feel they're in the same boat you're in. in yeah. Way. But I think this changed, when they got to these camps, it changed a lot of people's uh, Perception, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that had to be pretty horrible. So so sometime, maybe not today, but sometime if you get those other pictures that you took with your own camera, you know, with the bulldozer that you described, I wouldn't mind seeing those either. Um, and, but, but you say you think that when you got there it was within a day or so after the liberation? Yeah. Okay. Pretty sure. Yeah, because our people were involved in and stuff there. Mm -hmm. I think even after some of us left to go somewhere else. Okay. So, no. except that we were box camera guys, mm -hmm. and the only, and like I said, and I'm showing pictures of the war and stuff, and I said, you know, I'm probably wondering, you know, it's like you're doing nothing. Mm -hmm. Well, if you're doing something, you're not doing anything with the box camera. Yeah. Don't even have it maybe on you. You know what I mean? Uh, we, we, we weren't war cameramen. <laughs> but you were using your own camera we for were, photos. One we picked up somewhere, and, and this Italian kid, mm -hmm. uh, he claimed he couldn't speak Italian, but he could always get mm -hmm. stuff from them. <laughs> oh, boy. Yeah. Oh, and, 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 and he outfit. got the film. We, we didn't get film from the government. We had to get overseas film, whatever it was. So I had a lot of stuff, thanks to him, because <laughs> he he had worked at a photography studio, this kid I'm talking about. The Italian-American soldier, yeah. right? Yeah. Okay. And, uh, and so when he got home, and he sent me all copies of all these pictures. That, and he even had them marked up by dates. And I get so crazy, <laughs> like we're looking there, there's photos missing. I, 
I got a number there, so so I know the photo's somewhere. Okay. Uh, must be good if they wouldn't take it. Huh. But it may be somewhere around, but it's only my family, but okay. still. And uh, the same way with, I had these all blocked a week at a time. And, well, partly it falls apart in time, but, mm -hmm. but these kids start looking through it and they never, never put it back, no matter how much I tell. So I can't tell always what order no. stuff is. And it had it so much in order, you know, like from the beginning to the war. Chronologically. Yeah. yeah. Well, can, now, and this is going to be a totally different subject here, but uh, the McCarran coat, coat of arms that you showed me last time I was here, um, and I videotaped it, do you know why there's a camel set on the top of that or no? <laughs> no idea. I, I'd like to think. Uh-huh. <laughs> Because uh, I don't want to build the things up. It probably were camel herders. <laughs> I don't know. And, and, Are they going to say in Ireland? <laughs> no, no. You know, if they go back far enough, they might have been in the Middle East. Crusades. I'm just wondering if it was a symbolic thing, like we endure like well, a camel. Well, <laughs> well, the Haley's got three lion's heads. Yeah, that's true. And that's like a royalty and, symbol. And there, theirs is real for sure. I'm a little doubtful about the McCarran one. Okay. So the camel it's based thing on the name Karen, but you know that's that mean like black or something like that or in Gaelic or Karen, I can't remember. Well, it's supposed to be Scottish, which which is all right because, uh, you know, I've done the Y D N A. Did I ever tell you that? No. What is that? <coughs> Had the DNA taken? You know, they were doing the survey, and. Kind of like um, volunteers, although you paid mm -hmm. <laughs> to get it, and uh, and it showed that <coughs> my D DNA fits the DNA of the Northern Ir okay. Irish. It didn't, no surprise. <coughs> okay, except that we are a small, fairly small group. Only 20% of Northern Ireland is from our group. And they, our group goes back to we Niall. I'm, I'm trying to say it like might sound in Gaelic, but, <laughs> but, 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 but Neil, let's okay. see. And, yeah, and he was, uh, uh, you know, he's noted for when he defeats some a group, he takes uh, not a slave so much as take somebody in authority as a hostage. Uh -huh. And I think he was called Neil of the Seven Hostages. He had seven important people from England, or Scotland, wherever. And, uh -huh. But anyways, doing this, Neil, this, this group we're in, we're also in Scotland, so who knows which came first there. Mm, so it's, the okay. Y DNA also goes across into Scotland. Of course, <laughs> there's a, of course there's a lot in the U.S. because I remember yeah. the paper saying two million Irishmen in America descended from royalty. Well, <laughs> but if you call a guy, and they all were at one time, a guy who went around plundering it. Oh, and chips and stuff like that, you know. Uh, yeah, like Viking. <laughs> <laughs> uh. Maybe when they became rich and all that, the, a cold king or something, but... Oh, yeah, but yeah, not literally a king. But not, <laughs> okay. Okay, Joe. Um, so I got some interesting uh, parts of your life today and part of my current history. Uh but we're probably, like I just talked to you about, not going to finish this interview today. When I come back again, I'll talk to you about your life, particularly from World War II on. So, you know, just wanted to thank you for everything, and uh, and we'll pick it up next time, okay? Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. Okay, so when World War II ended, um, you were, uh, how long did you stay in the Army for? Through October of 45. And then you were shipped home, discharged, 
right. My brother and I landed almost, we landed the same month. Okay. And we both went to Dad's house. I hadn't been there for years, mm -hmm. but my mother had been put in a home because she had been left alone. Yeah. I After thought everything was okay when I left up in Wisconsin, mm -hmm. and she had never been well after the accident. Yeah, you were telling. Yeah. So, I guess she was wandering around alone, you know, an old lady, and, uh, well, she wasn't that old really, but, uh, but when I got home she was in a place in Wisconsin, the home, and uh, so I had known that early on in the Army, I guess Brother Jim had told me, mm -hmm. and from uh, from that time on I decided to start saving money, and they took money out of my big paycheck mm. <laughs> and to uh, put in bonds, really, government war bonds. Mm -hmm. And so when I came home, I had $1,600. And uh, that tidied me over. No, that, yeah, back in the day, that was more. Yeah. Was, but I mm -hmm. had to have, they didn't leave it in banks or anything, so I had to leave it with Dad and hoping. Mm. <laughs> but he's, as far as I know, he, he kept it all. Okay. And did your, uh, now you said Uncle Willie, my great-grandfather, he died just a couple weeks after the war ended, and obviously you couldn't make the funeral because you still hadn't come home from the war yet. And it was the story that he would had gone down to Florida and come back in well, Georgia on the way home? And I'm he was, not sure. I thought it was on the way home that my dad said, but it could have been on the way. But what he did say is that a priest in the neighboring town had recognized him being in mass that morning, so uh, that made some people satisfied that he'd been to church that day before. Okay. Obviously, just died in a heart attack in the whatever you want to call it. So he pulled over the side of the road and had a heart attack and in Georgia. Over to the side of the road. Was he on vacation in Florida, or did That's where it was, yeah. Okay. I know you already know what you're going to ask. This is Joe McCarran, Jr., or the third, and we are in Jefferson Barracks National Cemetery in St. Louis County, where we just had a ceremony over here. There was a table and everything for uh, your dad, Joe McCarran, Sr., who passed away. And his ashes were there. They had a flag ceremony. Uh, they handed you the flag. And they're going to intern the ashes up in um, near Freeport, Illinois, where the cemetery, which I filmed earlier, where his wife is uh, laid to rest. Now, the reason I'm doing this is um, I did that first video interview with Joe Sr. And we went up to his life and McCarran family history and his life up to the end of World War II. Then I did a second video interview where I was going to continue from World War II on, but we got sidetracked talking about a lot of other things in his life or McCarran family history. Again, we never really got there. So what I'd like to do, Joe passed away on Tuesday, I think six days ago. Um, and what I'd like to do is, with his son, Joe Jr., who's just about my age, is fill in the gaps uh, for the history of Joe's life after World War II, and I did talk to Joe Sr., and Joe told me a lot of things, but I never had it on videotape, so I'm going to bring some of that up. Um, now, uh, Joe Jr., um, from what I understand, when your dad got discharged at, at the war, he came back home, and didn't your grandfather, uh, the Joe Sr., um, he, didn't he open up like a fishery and restaurant somewhere, something like that? Didn't he work for that when he got home from the war? I mean, that, I understood something like that. No, my father or his your, father? his father, your grandpa. Like I understood, there was like a fishery 
a fish fish hatchery up in Wisconsin or something, but it was also a restaurant too. They had something going on that I think. Uh, all I can tell you is it didn't pan out. It didn't, but he worked. I thought he worked there for a little while. I, w I thought it was some kind of shop, but I don't really know any more than that. Okay. It was some kind of shop that he tried out. That's what I remember. And then later he got on a road crew or something like that, or was he? You know, when he when he eventually ended up meeting your mom, wasn't that the case? Like either a road crew or some sort of. A, Are we talking about my father? Your now? father, yeah. Uh, yeah, he was doing something like that actually with his brother. His um, brother Jim, yeah. My uncle Jim, and she worked at a restaurant that was owned by my grandfather, her father, and uh, that's where they met. Okay, and she, they were about 16 years apart, right? 14. 14? She was 16, he was 30. Okay. And uh, that wasn't so odd back then. Now <laughs> I think These really, days it's taboo, yeah. I think it'd be, yeah. But they didn't hook up actually until 1832, so when they got married. Yeah. And. Uh, oh, they were 18 and 32 when they got married? Okay. Yeah, and you didn't mess around back then until you got married. At least that's what. Officially. <laughs> At least that's what they said. Yeah. My mother told me. But. My uh, my last girlfriend and I were, you know, she was 19 and I was almost 37 when we started dating. So we had a 17-year gap. So I, I can identify with your dad. Well, I like young women myself. <laughs> yeah, same here. They're yeah. My, when they're my age, they're a little... Eh. No, I, 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 gee, trust me, I know where you're coming from, but... They, they're, they're a little bit more cynical. Yeah. Let's put it that way. Um... So, uh, I keep telling my daughter, bring, bring some of your girlfriends. Friends, <laughs> you're eating my mind, I swear. <laughs> we think great minds think alike. Um, definitely, uh, Irma Karen Now that she's 27. Yeah. Um, well, uh, so, okay, so he worked, I thought he worked on a road tour or something, came through there and to that restaurant, and that's how he I did, met her. Yeah, he did a lot of work, you know, a, a lot of different kind of stuff, you know, uh, um, uh, lumberjack, surveyor. He did a lot of different things, so, but you know, low-paying kind of labor kind of jobs. And was their marriage ceremony? I guess was it a, just a quick courthouse thing? It it did. I from what I heard, it wasn't any big thing. It was just those two went off somewhere. I think by themselves, as far as I know. You don't know what date they got I never married. I saw no. any wedding pictures or anything. Just them in a in a picture, a marriage picture of some kind, and. Uh, 1949, I guess they got married. Yeah. And uh, as far as I know, I never saw any wedding pictures. I never heard about any wedding. I think they just kind of made it a quiet thing with the two of them. Yeah, and your mom, as I saw. As I you know, know. Young pictures of your mom. She's a very beautiful woman. She was, you know. She, she modeled. They asked some guy on the Illinois University. I guess when he was going to school there, she was pretty young and hanging around there, doing some kind of small work there. I don't and her name was Polly Rogers when she was born and then she right. became Polly McCarran. And some guy asked her to model and she modeled in some advertisement magazine. Really? When she was a teenager? Well. After she got married? She was about 19 or something. Okay. Soon after they were married they didn't have kids yet and he was on the campus and somebody saw her and there's pictures of it too. I didn't know that. I'd like to see that sometime, yeah. Yeah, she's posting her clothes. And so, um, now what were some of the jobs? So, so kind of give me a progress from the time they got married, like kids, jobs that he had, places that he moved. Kind of give me a synopsis of what happened, you know, in, in what order after that, you know? After that? Well, you know, from the time, of, let's say from the time he got married. Okay, the, the jobs, the Went moving. Went to school. Went to Pretty school? Pretty soon after that. And they were pretty poor. They were poor. Where did he go to school at? Uh, University of Illinois. Oh, okay. So he's up by Champaign Urbana, where I. Right. Not where I live, but I. That's my state, yeah. And uh, you went to Northern Illinois? I went to NIU, Northern DeKalb, where I, I still live in DeKalb, yeah. Right. And uh, then. My nephew graduated U of I. Yeah. As far as I know, it was. Uh, he could have went in, got his PhD, finished up, but uh, what did what what major? Got uh, well, mathematics, you know, science uh, uh -huh. was his. You know, 
And he actually taught for a while. I didn't even remember him saying, telling me that before. Astronomy teacher up at the Science Center. Wow. Uh, yeah. He had an impressive life. Yeah. His later life, he lived quietly. Um, well, he got a map job, right? I say quietly, but he went off traveling. He, he traveled the world by himself. He mm -hmm. wanted to go alone, and uh, I don't blame him. Uh, he went out and traveled a lot. He didn't take your mom with too much, or? No, uh, she was living, they were separated for a while. They were oh, I didn't know that. For several years. She was in Denver. I lived with her in Denver. Did they I get back to? I went to high school in Denver. I didn't know that. Yeah. Did they ever get back together? Yeah, when she got sick, she came back and lived in Denver. They lived together in the last, uh, let's see, probably mid-90s. She got sick and she couldn't work anymore. And how long were they separated for? From 95 to 2008 when she died, they were together. Uh, they were, uh, I was 12, and 12, 12, about 12 years. Wow. She lived in Denver, Texas, Houston, Texas, and uh, Minnesota. Your dad's a nice guy. I'm surprised they couldn't get along well, you know. I don't know. Well, I guess people have their issues. She was a difficult woman. She Again, I know nothing about her, yeah. She, uh, she, had, she just wanted to go off on her own. And your own woman, I guess. Uh, I don't know all the details. I was busy with my own thing. I hear you. When you're a young young guy, you're that's not my problem. So basically, his first two kids were the twins, uh, Debbie and Linda. What? That's when he, he, he got out of college early and went to work. And uh, was that the work with the map thing, the cartoon? And what, what was that again? It was the. That's all he did till uh, 1982. And what was the official, it was a government agency, right? Yeah, so 1954 to, uh, well, 19, might have been a little later, 1955 approximately to 1982. And what was the name of the agency you worked for? Well, God, I know it's the it. United States something. Uh, Defense Mapping Agency, I think. So they, they studied maps, they made maps. I know it, I just can't, I can't think of everything. But it, it, it's down there right now. It's downtown St. Louis, right on the riverfront. And what was his job in there? What did he do with the maps? Well, I don't know all the details of that. Okay. <laughs> but something to do with military maps, yeah, creating them or analyzing them or something. You know a little bit about history. You ever heard of the Cuban Missile Crisis? Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, his crew, I guess, discovered those uh, hiding, missiles. hiding uh, the, uh, missiles over there in Cuba. Wow. They were the ones that discovered it. And you know, the funny thing about it, I asked him a lot of questions, and still, I guess, to the end, he goes, some things are secret that I was sworn to secrecy about, so there's some things that he couldn't speak about. He took with him, huh? Yeah, he took with him. Wow. And he was, you know, he took an oath, so, and he stuck to it. Wow. So there were some things that happened that probably would have been surprised by, but he couldn't go there. Huh. He worked for the government, you know. Wow. So he got that job about 10 years after the war. Yeah. And uh, he was married by then. And, and, uh, and what years were Debbie and Linda born, do you remember? 54. Like, 54. 1954. Okay, so he's still in college or just getting out of college, right? Yeah, they were like born there in Champaign. Right. In Champaign, okay. And they came over... I won't swear to it, but they soon, they might have went somewhere else in between, but then they ended up here in uh, Maplewood. Okay, and when was the next daughter, Patty, born? 57. And then uh, Kitty, the third, the fourth daughter, 58. And then seven more years before you were born, the first boy, Joe, and the last child. 1965. 65. And you're, you're seven months younger than me, or just a few months. You're August, right? This month is your birthday? They call 1965 when America culturally completely changed the culture. I mean, uh, so, uh, That's when we started NAM, you know? Yeah, the NAM thing, uh, just, it was a real cultural change. And uh, they, I always say 1965 really was, they said that uh, 1965, the 50s ended. In other words, the culture was still kind of the same as it was yeah. in the 50s until 1965. People still dressing the same and listening to similar music and <laughs> clothes. And 
the fedora hats even for older people. Yeah, they were still. Yeah. Kennedy killed the hat business. They said. Yeah. So you were, um, so you were basically, uh, yeah, basically my, so they had you guys in a row and he, and he was working on that map thing pretty much your whole, yeah, yeah, That's, your whole life up until you were 17 when he retired. Yeah, he stayed with that company. Um, do you, do you remember, did he have a retirement party or summer? I was in Denver. Okay, with your mom? No, well, yeah, I was with her. Let's see. And then I went back there to live on my own for a while. I back and forth a lot, but at the time they had the party and all that, I was not there. And your siblings, uh, did they stay with your dad, or were they already adults by the time your parents separated? Some of us stayed. Uh, Debbie was married in '72. Yeah, '73. Yeah. And, they were uh, pretty young. Seventy-eight, somewhere around there. Or you I, mean Mary? I don't even re really remember living with Debbie. I was so young. Wow. So, uh, and then uh, Patty, Patty would leave and come back, leave and come back, and Katie and me stayed there for quite a while. Kind of the kids in the house there for a while. Huh. Throughout the early eighties and all. Wow. So, so he had five kids in his main career uh, through his life. The main one was that uh, through the map agency. Um, Everything before that was low paying stuff. It wasn't career stuff. And then uh, after, so he, he had a very long retirement. That's like 34 years, right? He, yes. Depending on what month he retired, you don't know, remember what month, in 82? No? Yeah, that's uh, 34 years. It's a long one. I know because my last girlfriend was born in 82 and she's 34 now. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, unless so, it was uh, lately. Most people don't get to retire that long. Yeah, that was, a, that was a night, and you know, your dad was so healthy and everything all the way up until a year or two ago, so. And like I said, I always have a big, big regret that I could not come here for a 100th birthday party like I wanted to, you know, but. Uh, we kind of figured he wouldn't that night. Yeah. We can't even get through that, so. I, I kind of, from what I was hearing, I was biting my nails too. I don't think he's going to make it till February next year, I, you know. I didn't, his quality of life was so low. Yeah. It was uh, not very much fun. Not a lot of joy at the end for him. So just everything was just shutting down. Do you know what he officially passed away from, or was there an official cause? Old age. Just old age, yeah. Officially, everything just was shut down. Uh -huh. the, uh, well, I don't. Did you see his foot? It was rotten away. No, I didn't. No. We couldn't remove. He was too old, so if we would have removed the foot. He wouldn't survive the operation because of his age. Oh my God! Was it gangrene or something? Well, eventually it would became that. We had him on antibiotics, just keeping him alive. But uh, everything just the liver shut down, kidneys shut down. Oh. Heart started finally. His heart was good for a long time, and, but everything was shutting down. His mind was shutting down. And this is all in the last two years, and right? He had become so weak, he just couldn't. He couldn't lift himself up, and if you helped him, everything hurt him. If you touched him like that, he would be in pain. So it was real hard. It was not a lot of fun. He just slept a lot. It was hard. It's too bad because he was up and walking all the way. Was it? Two, would you say two years ago is when everything started going bad? Yeah. Well, a year and a half, I'd say. Really. His 98th birthday. I was going to take him. Barber to get his hair cut, and that's when he, he was getting hard, just getting up, and he would have had to be on a walker. That's when it, you know, when he started doing the walker. He was walking around pretty well before that, and yeah, so he had a, it wasn't a long, long illness, you know, it was, uh, he got to live healthy for a long time. He's always been old to me. Yeah, your whole life, huh? Yeah, he's always seemed like an old guy to me, so. Well, let's see, in 1965. He was 48. 48 years old, wow. Yeah. And so by the time you even have memories of him, he's into his 50s, you know? Yeah, he was, I was the guy with the oldest father, that's for sure. Yeah. I was the guy with the old, old dad, but he was in good shape, so. Yeah, he was. Now, one thing that I thought was interesting was uh, on the World War II honor flight, uh, everybody 
all the old veterans were able to take one relative with them. And when I saw a video of it, everybody's exiting the plane. It's like the relative pushing the veteran in a wheelchair, one after the other, after coming off the plane. They videotape. But your dad is just out there walking alongside him. And he seemed to be the one guy's on his feet back then. Yeah, he's you know? probably older than a lot of them. Uh, yeah. He was kind of old when he went in. A lot of them were 18. He was like 24 when he got in. So by the end of the war, he was 27. He was no kid. Yeah. However, uh, I didn't go with them. You saw video footage of that? I saw video footage of them coming back from the inner flight. Like 2008 or something, 2009, something like that. I think so because I, I think yeah. I met I, I met him in person in 2010. Yeah, so they went on a plane out there and who did he go with? My sister Kitty. Kitty, okay. I didn't go. I don't fly. <laughs> I love DC, but I never seen that moment. I place. Have to drive everywhere. I hear you. If I go, because I have a sinusitis. If I get on a plane, it's like torture. Oh. Uh, torture. And is um, but what you were telling me, uh, you went with your dad to the 50th reunion of uh, his veterans group. At he had never gone till the last one. And I go, well, it's the 50th. So let's go. Nah. He said, nah. I go, I'll go with you. And he goes, well, if you go with me. So I went with him. And I met all those old guys I'd seen in the photographs. Uh huh. And I recognized them right away. Wow. And uh, they saw me, and I was that age when they last saw him. So they said they knew it was him because they saw me. They said, <laughs> That's how we remember you. They wouldn't have recognized him. Yeah, because you looked like he did back then. Right. And he looked like an old man they would have never recognized. No, he wouldn't. They, and he shrunk so much. He, he, did, you know, he didn't look the same. Yeah, I've seen pictures of them as a young man. You did have a strong resemblance to them yeah. back then. So. And yeah, what, how old he got, uh, you'll never see me look like that because I won't make it that way. Oh, I hope you do. I hope you do, buddy. You because know. I smoke. Yeah. I'm going to smoke one even if it bothers you. I'm pretty <laughs> far away from you. Okay. Well, we're pr that's pretty much what I wanted to know anyway. So thank you, Joe. Sure. And you have a good one. And There's no more questions? That's uh, That's about all I could think of. If I think of any else, I'll do a quick addendum. <laughs> okay, signing out. You got a scan of the cemetery?